be had. And um, thanks again for, for putting this together. It's just it's, this is tremendous to have so many people come out for an event like this. And um, um, you'll hear a little bit more about Kat in one of my talks. Um, and there's even a couple of pictures of her working on my, my new building where she spent part of the summer two years ago. But um, anyway, it's just my pleasure right now to introduce Tom Seeley. And um, I'm not going to say too much about him. Um, he's the, the chairman of the Department of um, Neurobiology and Behavior. I'm not sure I get that right now. We're now university. And he's a wonderful guy. It's my great privilege to be his friend, um, as well as an admirer. And um, the thing I love most about Tom and his work is the way he's focused on the bees living on their own in the wild without um, worrying about our influence on them and, and how they've been able to survive and thrive just, uh, just as bees. But anyway, um, Tom's my favorite beekeeper and he's soon to be yours if he's not already. So please welcome Tom Steele. Hear me okay? Can I speak at this level? Great. <clears throat> thank you, Kurt. That's great. I appreciate your introduction. Uh, thank you, Kat, for inviting me here. I really look forward to this meeting uh, because it's about treatment free beekeeping. Uh, and as Kurt said, I'm, I'm <clears throat> particularly interested in how bees live in nature where, of course, there is no treatment of the bees. And you'll be happy to know that, at least in my neck of the woods, they're surviving very nicely. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, this morning I'm going to talk about the studies of how swarms choose their homes. And that actually does connect to treatment-free beekeeping, because the story that I'm going to tell you is about what happens if we don't treat a swarm, we don't capture a swarm and put it in a hive. How do they go through their process of finding a, a home by themselves? And you can see I titled the talk Democracy. How do you mean democracy? You might be wondering why democracy. Well, it's, I like this link to, uh, to some of our own affairs. We know that um, democracy is a government in which the power is vested in the members of the, of the group, not in a, uh, not a particular small subset of leaders. But you can think of it more broadly. It's not just a human phenomenon. It exists in nature as well. There are many animal groups in which decisions are made for the group by the group, by the whole group's members. A flock of, of cabinet keys deciding when to take off in the morning is done collectively, for example. And, uh, it's a tricky form of, of decision making. As we all know, many people in human contexts have said that democracy is, uh, as did Winston Churchill, the worst form of government, except all the other forms that have been tried. Uh, and we, and of course, we see that in our own um, U.S. government right now. <laughs> Troubles making decisions. Uh, at the same time, a more positive, uh, positive view about uh, elected decision making is that with the right organization, and I want to stress, right organization, democratic groups are remarkably intelligent, smarter than the smartest individuals in them. This is a point made by James Surowiecki in his lovely book, The Wisdom of Crowds. Uh, the key thing there is right organization, and that begs the question, what is the right organization? And we'll come back to that uh, at the end of the talk. When we see what the, how the bees do it, we'll look at the, uh, what I like to call the five habits of highly effective time. <laughs> So, oh, and one last part of this production, why democracy, not a monarchy? Well, you're beekeepers, so you know that the queen is, is a very important individual. She's the mother of the entire colony, but she's not making the moment. She's not really making decisions um, for the colony. For example, she's not telling the foragers where to go and forage, nor the bees to go to bee production and cooling, whether to turn up bee production or turn up cooling, and, or whether to build coal or not. And certainly, she's not involved in the household bee. She's a, she's a passive individual. So it really is a democratic, dispersed, distributed decision making. Uh, we're going to be looking at this particular case of democratic decision making by a swarm of bees. And because you're beekeepers, I'll just quickly go through this. You all know that a swarm is a reproductive crop of fuel of a colony. 
And that uh, contains typically a queen bee and several thousands of worker bees. They need to find a protective home. It's a matter of life or death. They need that protection, uh, protection from the cold in the winter and protection from uh, predators and others in the, uh, in the summer. Uh, the decision is not made by uh, all of the bees in the uh, swarm. And I see these, some of these slides are cut off, so let's see if that still works OK. <laughs> It's made by uh, the decision um, of those 10,000 bees. It's only about 3 to 5% of the bees um, which are actually going to be involved actively in the decision making, which are the scout bees. Um, so the story today is, is a, a, a story of the remarkable behavior of these tiny little, of these little scout bees. Now, who are these scout bees? They tend to be drawn from the oldest, most experienced bees in the swarm. Bees that move before the, they were in a swarm, they were functioning as foragers. So they've had lots of experience flying out from their hive, coming back home. And that's what they're going to be doing here in large measure. Flying out from this swarm, looking, exploring for miles around, looking for potential home sites. What are they looking for when they do that? Uh, is there a way to turn down the lights in here? These slides will be a little easier to see if we can shut down the overhead lights. Uh, thank you very much. Here's we have a dream home for honeybees. This is a sugar maple that's up in the woods. It was up in the woods behind my house. Uh, what made us a dream home were a couple of things. The entrance up here was high off the ground. They like that. That gives them safety. From Predators like bears, which have a hard time finding bees living so high in trees. It has a small entrance, it's about, uh, it's, uh, about uh, four square centimeters in this particular, uh, four square inches in this case, give them protection as well from the wind, cold winds in the winter. This is that tree, cavity exposed, cut, cut the tree down and dissect the nest and expose the nest. This, even though that entrance is just a knot hole, a small opening. It went into a rather large cavity, as you can see. These like it, their cavities about 40 meters. And if possible, they can find it in a sturdy tree. I think that is probably attractive to them as well. You might wonder, how do we know that bees are things that actually matter to the bees? Um, well, back in the uh, mid-70s for my uh, PhD work, I, I studied the, the nest site preferences of bees, and it involved putting up um, nest boxes in pairs, and the two boxes in within each pair would be identical in all ways except for one variable. In this case, it was a variable of, nest, of entrance area. So they're both the same height, facing the same direction, same size and shape of cavity, but uh, one was had a small entrance, the other had a large entrance. Arrange this mm -hmm. and fall off. <laughs> And the, what this revealed, and I put these out in pairs, see which one was first occupied by a swarm. And the swarms told me by their boats of where they where they moved into that they, entrance area is important, entrance height is important, entrance direction. They like them to take south. They like the entrance to be near the bottom of the cavity. They like the cavity to be uh, smaller, bigger than 10 meters, and smaller than 40 meters. 10, 40 meters, uh, smaller than 100 meters. 40 meters is the volume of a one feet 10 frame high volume. And if they can find a cavity with their homes in it, that's nice too. Now, what does the scout bee do when she finds a potential home site? In, this, in the summer, during the swarming season, if I walk in my woods, sometimes I will see scout bees. What they're doing is they're going up and down trees, looking for knot holes or cracks in the trees. When a bee finds one, she'll spend, when the scout bee finds a potential cavity, home site, she'll spend about 30 minutes making her own private evaluation of the site. And she does this by making multiple visits inside the site. This is the movements of one scout bee during uh, four of her 25 visits when she was expect expecting a cubicle experimental nest box for a contractor. You can see she's walking all around inside there. And I don't have time to go through it today, but these movement patterns, this walking, is involved in how she measures the volume of the cavity. If you cause her to an experimental situation, you cause her to walk more than she normally would, she thinks the box is bigger than it really is. And conversely, if you 
have her walk less, by having the walls rotate, um, she will think it's smaller than the old days. So we know that walking is involved in measuring the volume of the cavity. So she's measuring the volume, the entrance size, the entrance height. And by the end of her 30 minutes of inspection, in ways that are still quite mysterious, she has a, a sense of the overall desirability of that site as a home site. She refers to it evidently to a built-in sense of what is an excellent site and what's not a good site, and she can judge where on that range of poor to excellent the site that she's just inspected, where it falls. She will now fly back to the swarm and make a public report on, of her discovery on the surface, actually on the side of the swarm. She's going to dance on the vertical surface of the swarm. And now she's going to share with her fellow scout bees the direct information about the direction, distance, and as we'll see, the quality of the site that she's found. Let's just take a quick look at what we're going to see here a scout bee, an excited scout bee, performing a lateral dance. And you'll see her dancing on the back of her, of her, of her sisters, the non-scouts in the storm. Okay, here's our scout bee. She's waggling, stops, waggles, and stops, comes around, waggles, and stops. You can see lots of other scout bees pressing along behind her, getting the information from her. And you notice she's consistent, she points to the left. When she does the waggle movement, and each waggle run lasts for about a second. Thousand one, thousand two. Yeah. And you can see all the other bees that are you know, quiescent, the non scale bees sitting there quietly. <coughs> okay, so here's how this information about direction and distance is coded in that waggle dance. They indicate the, dis the direction uh, relative to a reference point of the sun, the direction of the sun. So for example, this wagon dance is, of course, used for indicating food sources as well. So if a bee wants to indicate a patch of flowers that's 40 degrees to the right, <coughs> whose direction is 40 degrees to the right in the direction of the sun, well, when she's inside the hive and on the, doing her dance on the combs, and she does those waggle movements, she will do them a in a direction 40 degrees to the right of uh, straight up. So inside the eye, straight up is the reference direction. So directions indicated by the angle relative to the vertical <coughs> straight up of the wagon run. And the distance is indicated by the duration of the wagon run. The greater the distance you to a food source or a home site, the longer the phase of each one of these wagon runs. The one that we just saw in the video, but it was about a, about a second, which means that the nest site that we have found is about 600 meters away. It's, it still is, amazes me that insects can do this communication system. Because when you think about it, a bee following a, a, a dancing bee, she's measuring the duration of this waggle line. And then she does that in the dark, it's through sound. She can hear how long the bee is waggling. But then she, when she leaves the hive or leaves the swarm, she has to convert that perception of a time variable and translate that into a distance variable. It's, it, it's, it is remarkable. And the fact that, they even, that this operates over such vast distances, thousands of meters, is further, further amazing, particularly in the context of the house hunting process, where the target isn't a patch of flowers, you know, something on the scale of its room. It's a tree with a, with a small knot hole in it. That's what now, this waggle dance was encoded by this gentleman here, Carl von Frisch, and he worked it out at the end of World War II, 1946. Um, and, uh, but the other, there's another very important individual in this photograph here, Martin Lindauer. And the reason I'm highlighting Martin Lindauer is he's the gentleman that, that worked out that these used this waggle dance not only for indicating food sources, but also for indicating home sites. And the way this happened uh, is that one day Lindauer, who was a student with Carl von Frisch, came out at the Zoological Institute in Munich, saw a swarm of bees like this, saw bees dancing on the swarm. And he first thought that these bees were advertising food sources, because that was the context in which Carl von Frisch had studied the land of bees advertising rich food sources. But Lindauer was a very good observer, 
And you notice that none of these bees carry back pollen and none of them regurgitated nectar. In fact, these bees that he saw doing the dancing, when they finished their dances, they walked around and begged food from other bees. They looked like they were hungry. Many of these bees were also dirty. Some of them had um, soil on them. Some had soot on them. And he picked one of these sooty bees off and he sniffed it. He said it smelled like a chimney sweep. And that told him that those bees were coming back from unused chimneys or broken chimneys. And he was making these observations in 1949, which was just a few years after the end of World War II, two years after. He was making them in Munich. Munich was heavily bombed. And so those scout bees that he was seeing there were bees that were finding home sites out in the rubble of Munich. So, but he didn't leave his observations there, though those were pretty telling. Those were made it very clear that these weren't going to flowers. He then had the good insight to realize, I can actually eavesdrop on what the scout bees are saying, what they're communicating in a, in a swarm. So the next time he, got a, he saw a swarm, he sat down and made notes of every dancer that he could take notes on, on the swarm, from when the swarm settled to when it, after a day or two, it would fly to its new home site. And he, what he was doing, he was reading each dance that he saw and, and determining the location indicated by each scout bee's dance. And what he found was that initially the bees on a swarm performed dances for multiple sites around the city. But eventually, in a few hours or a few days, all of these dances are indicating just one location. And he was able to determine next that by following, by running in beneath the swarm as it flew away, that a swarm flies to that site indicated by the, where the consensus of the dancers and it moves in there. For example, here's, here's a map he had in his paper on this where the Zoological Institute is, is here. This is the main train station in Munich. So a few blocks north of that was the Zoological Institute. Swarms were coming out of hives at the Institute here. And, he was, and these are the tracks that he was able to, where he was able to follow swarms from uh, when they made the decision here to their new home. So you can see one of the swarms flew just a couple blocks north. That wasn't too hard to follow. But this one flew way, way up there to the north. Uh, that was a long run. And here's one that went all the way down to the left of the zoological station, flew across the railroad tracks, passed here, down to the Theresian Bees, and that's where the Oktoberfest is held. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the right time of year for the Oktoberfest. So, um, that confirmed that, yes, these dances on the swarms really are indicating possible home sites, because we knew that where they settled on was where they moved to. And we never realized that in this nice concept, the scout bees conduct a democratic debate to choose their new home. What he was saying, what he was thinking, and it's based on what he was seeing, that many, many scout bees, hundreds of scout bees, were involved in this decision making. Because every time he saw a bee do a scout bee do a dance, he put a dot of paint on that bee. And then he'd read her dance, and then he'd go on to the next dancer. He couldn't follow every scout bee throughout the whole process. But he knew, he knew that he was recording that there were hundreds of scout bees involved in this dance process. And he, put, he would put the queen in a little cage to physically separate her in the, from the rest of the work, and so she couldn't have direct contact with him, and he knew that she did not play a role. He wrote this work up in 1955. I'm really sorry these some slides are put off, but that's just the way the projector is aimed. Um, he wrote this up in 1955, and, but he wasn't really able to get, uh, fully address this question. He did a beautiful job given the tools that he had available at the time. He told me um, his tools were very simple. He had, a, he had a notebook and he had a pencil. He had a chair. He had a little paint set. He had a wristwatch for timing the, the dances and he had a stopwatch for measuring how the line would run. That was it. He didn't even have helpers. So he wasn't able to really, wasn't able to watch the process in great detail. But he got a good overall picture which set the stage. So that was published in 1955. And the puzzle was left with us. Really, what's going on there? How do the scout bees conduct their democratic decision making? So that's where I came into the picture, admired this paper for a long time, tried to address the question myself in the mid-70s, but we didn't have the technology then. But by the mid-90s, we had very, really good video equipment. 
good computer power, we're able to look against this and this, um, take, a, take the system apart. Starting point was to make a de detailed eavesdropping on a swarm of bees, and to look at what the scout bees are doing. To do that in high, with high resolution, I needed to follow the activities at the individual level. I needed to know what each scout bee did throughout the whole process. So I make a I can make swarms where each scout, each bee in the swarm is labeled with a clean tag and a mark for individual identification. I make swarms where all 4,000 bees were labeled from the beginning. I put, because I had to label them all because I didn't know which ones would be the scouts. I take that swarm, take those bees, got the queen at the stage, now I'm sure here on this swarm map, the bees would cluster on the board uh, on the swarm map, and a video camera would be aimed at the, at the mass of the bees. And thank goodness the scout bees do their dancing on the outside surface of the swarm. <laughs> so you can see it. It's like uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of good, good fortune here. So in doing that, um, you can get a record from start to finish. You can see every bee. You can record all of the activity. You know, which scout bee performs the dance when, how many dance circuits she does, the place she's indicating. You can have a complete record of the signaling by the scalpings on the surface of the swarm. When you do that, you get this pattern, which we'll go through. This is the most important slide in this talk, so we'll go through this carefully. It's a record of, in one swarm, as it shows its home, this is a typical swarm, and the scalpings reported that and discovered 11 different sites. There were, of the 4,000 bees, 149 of them were active as scalpings. And this is the pattern of dancing that they generated over the three days of their decision making. It started on the 20th of July, ended on the 22nd. So it started, and each one of these diagrams, each one of these rectangles, indicates the pattern of dance signaling during, on the swarm during a, typically it's a two hour time period. Each arrow here indicates a nest site. So the direction of the arrow indicates the direction, in this case, to the east of the nest site. The length of the arrow indicates how far away the nest, that nest site, which would be the place where the skeletons is. In this case, it would be, uh, the arrow's about that long, so it's not quite two kilometers or about a mile away. And the width of the arrow indicates how many different bees, how many different scout bees, during the two-hour time period, perform dances to advertise or promote that site. So this arrow is fairly wide. It was about 10 scout bees. So starting out, you can see the swarm came out in the morning, or was set up in the morning. So dancing started a little after 10 o'clock, and during the first two hour time period, a variety of sites were advertised. Most by just one bee, but some of them had by several bees. Next two hour time period, same sort of thing. A variety of sites, different directions, different distances. Well, none of them um, uh, didn't even come out of the signal. Third two hour time period, here we are at the end of the afternoon, 3 to 5 p.m. Same sort of pattern, a lot of these sites are being advertised by the dancing bees. Here we are at the end of the day, 5 to 7 p.m., still a variety of sites, but two sites, one in the south and one in the southwest, are getting most of the, receiving most of the promotional activities by the scale bees, getting so most of the dance attention. Things start up the next morning, really basically the same situation. The site to the south, the site to the southwest are leading in popularity. During that morning, popularity grows most strongly for the site to the southwest. It's almost dominating the whole uh, signaling process. By the end of the morning, but then it started raining. Whole thing, whole signaling process shut down. Next morning, Things started up again. You can see that all of the dances now, every bee that danced, and I don't know if you can see this, there are 73 different bees, scout bees, that performed waggle dances advertising the site in the southwest. And that was the only site that was advertised. I'd like to show this slide because it shows what I think is something very remarkable. That these little insects have the ability to go out, find lots of options, and winnow out the poorer ones, and settle and build an agreement. Isn't that remarkable? We've done like bees, on like insects. And the colony is really processing a lot of information here. Getting information, sorting through their options, 
choosing one of them. What's even more remarkable is that agreement isn't just one of the options, it's the best site. Now, how do I know that when these swarms settle in on, the, on that one site that it's the best site? Well, I know it not from this work, because I didn't have control of the nest sites. This was done at my laboratory, and these, the sites that these were finding were trees out in the forests around the laboratory. Uh, I had to go to a place where I had control of, to know how well the bees make the decision. I needed to go to a site where I could control the nest site options of the bees. And to do that, I had to go to an island off the coast of Maine, off of southern Maine. It's the Apple Island. Uh, Cornell University just happens to own this island for the purposes of a marine laboratory. Um, and furthermore, what is also just a stroke of immense good fortune is that this island has, first of all, it has no honeybees. Yeah. Secondly, it's six miles out, so it's too far from the mainland for the scouts to go back and find trees on the mainland. And most importantly, it has no large trees on the island. So there are no natural nest sites for the bees on this island. I realized that, okay, this is a great laboratory. This is a great opportunity to have control of the situation. Because it means that it means that I could bring a swarm of bees out to this island, put out nest boxes, and then the, the bees would have to choose among the options that I presented because that would be all that they would find. So here's the logic. I bring out a swarm of bees, now I'm going to the swarm board, put it up on a porch in one of the buildings at the center of the island. So the swarm is here. And I put out five nest boxes in this fan-shaped array. Four of them are going to be OK home sites. Uh, but one of them is going to be excellent. So it's like a multiple choice test where there are five possible answers. <laughs> the question is, how well could they solve that problem? And I do this over and over again with swarms. This is what the nest boxes look like. The G, to adjust the quality of them, I had this inner wall. I also had an entrance to adjust the size of the entrance, but I gave them a good entrance. A small, nice small entrance. But I would give them, I would change the volume of the box. If I took out this inner wall, it was 40 meters, what they really wanted. Or I could put the wall in, in fact in this position, and it would be um, only 15 meters. And so that was, that's still acceptable to these, but it's not as desirable. So four of the boxes would be set at 15 meters, one at 40 meters. And here's an example of how well they solved this problem. I've done this experiment 10 times now. And does it always choose the best site? Not quite always. Done it 10 times, nine times out of 10, they, they got it right. Um, uh, one time they, they didn't get it right, but I can explain that later in the discussion if you'd like. But here's the pat typical pattern. These what's plot here is time of day and number of scout bees visible at a nest box. And so the four of them, the first trial, the first swarm, um, you can see bees were finding off the, the mediocre nest boxes early in the day. They didn't find the excellent one at the far end of the array until the midday. But once they found that, interest built up there strongly and the bees took off and tried to move the nest box. Same sort of pattern happened the next day. In fact, again, found two of the mediocre boxes first, started to build up interest with them, but when finally found the excellent one, interest built up most strongly there. One thing I want to stress is that this is a winner's take all decision making pro process or popularity contest. Because you can see that as the popularity is going up, for example, at this box, it's going down to all of these boxes. And we'll come back to that. That's a real important part of this process. And the other thing I want to stress is that one thing you can see is that the swarm made its preparations to take off and fly the box. In, in all of these cases, once about 15, 10 to 15 bees are visible outside the box. We'll come back to that. That's, that's, they're not paying attention to ten, necessarily to the 10 to 15 bees, but it is a, was an early indication that there's a threshold level of popularity of scout bees at a box that tells the bees, oh, that's the box, that box is, has, uh, has received enough pop, is popular enough to be the winning box, to be the winning site. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that all this experimental work goes smoothly. When I was first doing these experiments, um, I set up my boxes and uh, was down at the boxes, 
if you're taking them on the way that the scalpies do appear, that the scalpies do not arrive. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to the swan, looked at the swan, saw whether there were bees dancing at all. Scouting, there were a lot of bees doing dancing. Yes, there were lots, they had been out scouting, and they were dancing very excitedly, most excitedly for the sight in the opposite direction of my experimental work. <laughs> they were pointing, they were going over to a house over here, which was, uh, that was not good news because I was, I had been told when I came to young to not poke around that house in particular. <laughs> Over there. Well, it was the house of Rodney Sullivan, who was a lobster fisherman. He, he did not like the strangers poking around his house, and my scalpies, like Linda was, he said, found a chimney. <laughs> and they were there, and Rodney wasn't too, too pleased by the bees, but he was pleased when I showed up and told him, wow, I can help you with this. <laughs> I don't know where those bees came from. <laughs> Each circuit has a waggle run to it, 
and then she stops and comes around and then does another waggle run. Each time she does a waggle run, that's a dance circuit and a return phase comes around to start another circuit. That's a dance circuit. And so I could set up the situation again on Apple or I where I put out two boxes, a 40 meter and a 10, 15 meter box. I have an assistant station in each nest box. He or she would put a dot of paint on each bee to identify which box the bee was coming back from. And then I'd be at the swarm recording for each scout bee how many dance circuits that she performed. And this is the pattern. It's a very, it's a lot of variation as you can see, but if a bee comes back from the dream home, the 40 meter box, they'll do on average 90 dance circuits, which is a lot of dance circuits really. But if they come back from the mediocre, the 15 meter, the fixer upper, um, it's only 30 dance circuits, and one third as many. And so, and if he does 90 dance circuits, rather than 30 dance circuits, a lot more scout bees are going to notice her dance, get the information, and be able to reach her son. So a key part of the whole thing, what biases the decision making in favor of the, the best site is that each bee judges the site's quality and then adjusts the length of the dance. And as I mentioned already, evidently these scouts know naked what makes a good home. Now, I don't know why there's so much noise in this system, but fortunately the whole system works on averages. And so on average, the better the sun, the more dancing it's done for. And you can visualize how this decision making, or this, this popularity context runs through this diagram where you have two sites, one one, it's a, let's say it's a mediocre site over here because it has a large entrance and an excellent site over here because it has a small entrance. Each one is advertised by, initially by one scout, but let's say it was discovered at the same time. Well, this blue dancer advertising that site, she's going to do 90 dance circuits on average compared to this one's going to do 30 dance circuits. So if you came back several hours later, you'd find that this bee has had three times the recruitment. This bee's had three times the recruitment success of this bee, so now there's three times as many bees going dancing for this site compared to this site. And you'll see there's two times as many bees visiting this site than this site. Because one thing I need to stress is that a scout bee discovers the site or gets recruited to the site, inspects it, comes back and dances for the site to advertise it, and then she'll actually go to that, that site and spend time at that site. And it turns out that spending time at that site that is critical in this whole thing. Well, dancing is very important, but also spending time at the site that she, she's favoring or supporting is important as well. And so this process snowballs to a point where almost all the dances on the swarm will be done for the best site, and there's a big crowd of bees at, that, at the winning site as well. Now, one question. You might be wondering, well, well, which of these matters? You've got, a, you've got a strong dancing at the swarm for the winning site, but you've also got a big crowd of bees at the site for the winning site. And conversely, at this other site, you only have a few bees and not much dancing. So what, what matters to the bees? Are they polling the dancing, or are they watching and looking at the buildup of popularity at the site? It turns out that it dips. I don't have time to go through the experiment, but this is what the scout bees pay attention to. It's probably much easier for the bees to sense that there's a buildup of bees, a critical number of bees that can reach at their site, than it is to poll the dances. Uh, that would be, I think that would be quite a challenge for the bees. So the winner is determined by which site first gains this critical number of scout bees hanging out at it. We don't know exactly how the bees measure this critical number. We also call it a quorum. Um, it seems to be about well, we have seen it. it's, it's when it gets to about 10 to 15 bees are visible outside the box, but I don't know if that's what the bees are paying attention to. And there can be 100, maybe 100 more bees inside the box at, at the time the form is reached. Now, when they, I don't have time in this talk. I can only talk today about how they make the decision, but I'll, and I, I don't really have time to explain what they do once they've made the decision, once they've built, gotten this quorum, but I'll just say a few words now. Once these scout bees at the winning site sense that a quorum has been reached here, they, they will come back to the swarm. They will make another signal, they'll stop the waggle dancing, they shut off their waggle dancing, and they start making a little signal 
called piping, hollow worker piping. It sounds like this. They do this, they're running around on the surface of the swarm. They make this sound by pressing their thorax. Each of these scalpies coming back starts piping. She presses it, you know, when she makes the piping signal, she presses her thorax against the body of, of the quiescent, that 97% of the swarm is inactive. This piping signal is telling all these quiescent bees to warm up their flight muscles, to get ready to fly away. And it will take them maybe half an hour or an hour to get everybody warmed up. Once our little scalpies have you know, running around doing all this piping, once they sense that every bee they're contacting is already good and hot, then you know, they do a buzz run signal, which is a bee running, bulldozing through the cluster of bees, buzzing their wings. That's the signal that tells them to watch in the flight. Probably some of how many people have ever seen a swarm lift off? Yeah. Okay, so you know it's fast. That's because all those bees have been primed for an hour or 30 minutes or so to warm up. So when that buzz run starts, boom, it, it dissolves. It takes less than 60 seconds to do And then once everybody's in the air, the skeletons still have one more challenge, and that is to guide that 97% of the bees that are ignorant about where the swarm should go to the home site. And they do that by pointing away, by flying through the top of the swarm in the direction, at high speed, in the direction of the new home site. All of the ignorant bees can look up and see these bees streaking through the top of the swarm and pointing away. And I should say that once a scout bee has streaked through the top of the swarm um, and reaches the front of the swarm, she then drops down and flies back more slowly to the rear of the swarm and then can shoot back through it, pointing away. Finally, when they get to the nest site, somehow they're able to scouts are able to put the brakes on this process. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if anybody's here watched the swarm move into a place, but it's just an amazing sight. This ball of bees is almost rolls to through the air to the site. And as it gets near, it slows down. And usually, not always, but usually stops right at the new home site. It's a beautiful breaking process. And then the scouts drop down to death go to the entrance of the nest site and uh, start scenting, releasing the uh, pheromone from the mazinoff gland to attract everybody to the entrance of the home. So those little scalpies have done an amazing job. They dial and found the site, the site which one to go to through the dance competition, the popularity contest, and they come back and warm everybody up, trick everybody to take flight, and then steer them there. It is one, it's gotta be one of the most dramatic examples of versatility and that's how we do it for time. Okay, just a couple minutes left. Okay, that's perfect. Last question is how do the scouts, and the second question, how does the scout's interest fade in this process? How does it fade for all the losing sites? Um, well, one possibility that would be natural to us, but turns out not to be how we do it, is you might think that the scouts walk around and compare sites, that a bee might, for example, come back from her site, do her dance, to advertise her site, and once she's finished her dancing, she might walk around on the swarm and listen to the dances of other bees, and if she finds another bee who's dancing very excitedly, she might go out and check the site. And if she finds that, oh yeah, that site's even better than the site that I know about, then the bee might change her mind and stop going to her site, stop dancing for the first site, for this new site. That makes a lot of sense, but if you actually track scout bees, they don't do that at all. Um, I tracked 40 scout bees from when they started their dancing to when they ceased their dancing, and they always stop their dancing before they've ever followed any other dancers. So they're not learning about it, a better site and using that to stimulate the ending of their dancing. We, we now know that there's two things going on where like bees lose their interest in dancing for a site. We know that all of the scalpies automatically, gradually lose interest in dancing for, the, for any given site. That's just a built-in part of their, this loss of enthusiasm, it's a built-in part of the process. But that's not the whole story. It turns out that these bees, these scalpies, are not only producing these excitatory waggle dances to bring more bees to their site, they're also producing an inventory signal whereby they go about and try to 
inhibit one another from dancing. Particularly, bees from the scouts from site A will see, will seek out bees dancing for site B and produce these inhibitory signals called stop signals on them, and that also causes bees to lose their interest in dancing. Let me show you what this looks like. It's something we just discovered in the summer of 2010. Scouts from different sites encourage one another, discourage one another by sending a stop signal. And a stop signal is produced by a bee, and I'll show you a video clip of it. It's produced by a bee from site A, walking around on the surface of the swarm, and when she finds a bee doing waggle dance for another site, a different site, she will hit that bee with her head. <coughs> And this is the distribution of where the bee that's getting the signal is hit on her body. It can be all over, but it's usually up around it. It's near the thorax, sometimes on the abdomen. And as she hits the bee, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a quick hit. It's 150 milliseconds, 0.15 seconds long. And while she's doing that, the bee is, that's it's doing this head bite, is making a sound. And again, she produces, all these sounds are produced by bees vibrating the flight muscles in the thorax. And the reason I think the bee has this little beep associated with it is it's a way of emphasizing to the bee that she's hitting that she's not just being jostled accidentally, but this is a real signal. She's being really good a signal. So the sender butts the dancer that you're getting while she hits her. And let's see what this looks like. What you're going to see is this bee's going to be our waggle dancer, minding her own business, doing her thing. You're going to see a bee, she's got a paint mark, yellow and blue, which tells us that she's from one site, and a bee from another site, a scout from another site, bearing a pink paint mark. It's going to come down from the top and do three, hit her three times. Oops. Oops. Okay. Let's have a black one. Oh, I need to adjust the sound. Yeah, we'll get the sound there. And that's it. That might be too much. Give it a whirl. Stop signals like 
a disagreement about saying, oh, hold on, there's something else out there. Yeah. Cool down, chill out on your idea, go on. And then lastly, group members vote independently. That's very important uh, and fairly. And I didn't express this maybe clearly enough with the bees, but each bee, even though she's being hit with these stop signals and so forth, she still gets to vote independently. She still gets to decide whether she's going to go out to that, book, that site or not and spend time there. Because remember, that's how the bee votes in favor of the site. And it is, as far as we can tell, it's one, one vote, one bee. So these are the lessons that I've learned from the bees. And uh, they seem to work well. Uh, uh, in fact, my successor also uses following bees. And I like to say that faculty meetings at universities can be proper as hornet's nests, but they're <laughs> easy. They don't want to be fine. And uh, Shakespeare intuitively to, to really understood this way back in 1599 when he wrote this for some of the time. Creatures of my rule and nature teach the active order to a people kingdom. Thank you very much. <laughs>